see all of you here today. And is it going to stop raining, you think? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for uh, our freedoms that we enjoy in this brief country. Thank that we can freely assemble here to worship. And thank you for your word that um, speaks to us and is ever so true. And Lord, I just ask that you would um, just be with our country right now as it is, seems to be just ripped apart and so divided. And Lord, it, it's uh, struggle with this pandemic and then the murder of This man, Lord, and just the outcry against that and these complex issues that face us. And Lord, we just we need you. We just need Jesus. And I think, Lord, about this week of the lady yesterday who uh, drove in, drove into the river, Lord. I believe they still haven't found her or her car. Um, oh, Lord Jesus, the, the loss of life. And the 16-year-old boy drove into a logging truck the next day. And Lord, we're, we're, we're surrounded by tragedy and death and suffering. And um, Lord, our hearts are just heavy. My heart is heavy. This and Father, I just ask that um, Lord Jesus, you would just come. And this old sinner's world, Lord, is just so disappointing. And we need Jesus. And we need to look forward to when we will be with Jesus forever. And the curse will be gone. There will be no more tears. No more crying, no more bloodshed, no more suffering. And Lord, we look forward to that day with eager hope. And we groan with creation, that all of creation is groans and travails and is waiting to be released from the suffering that sin has brought on this world. Lord, we just ask that you would open our eyes so we may see what your word has to say and that you would help us as a church to do right and to follow what your word has to say. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Okay. I would like to have the kids come down uh, for our children's lesson. So kids, if you want to just come down here uh, and kids, we've been we've been going through the the uh, story of Jimmy, right? And um, Jimmy lived in a perfect world, and everything was perfect for Jimmy, right? Um, it never rained, it never snowed, the sun was always shining, the grass never had to be cut, the grass was perfect, trees were always manicured, right? And his dog was like a robot, and would fetch him the paper, never so big. But the problem is, is that Jimmy never had any difficulty. And so, thus he never developed any what? Do you remember, boys and girls? Character. And that's why Jimmy shaped more like a Lego man, right? Because he didn't have any character. And the Bible tells us that, um, that every problem has a what? It has a purpose. And the purpose of every problem is what? To Right, the purpose of every problem is to make us better, not bitter. And then we had seen that if, when we are faced with a problem, if we ask God to change the look of things, you remember? The look of things will change. Yes. Yeah. Well, what we remember, what happened with Jimmy, is all of a sudden his world was changed. 
And this baseball comes flying through and kind of wrecks his little bubble of a nice world, and everything changes for Jimmy. And the question is, is Jimmy going to say, okay, wait a second, every problem has a purpose. The purpose of every problem is to make me better, not bitter. And I need to ask God to give me a different look at this, and then things will change. Does he do all that, or what does he do? No, we've seen Jimmy gets angry. It's like all of us. We get angry that life has not gone our way. And we, more than anything, we want, as, as, as immature Christians, we just want everything to go the way we want it to go. And the problem is, is God would love to do that, but, but it would never grow our character. And we'd never become soft and gentle and malleable people. We would never mellow. We would insist on our rights. We'd insist on control and all of those things that make us fragile, brittle, unusable people. So Jimmy gets angry, and what we see is Jimmy's dog does what? Takes the baseball. This is a brand new thing. This dog has never seen it before. This dog has all kinds of freedom. And while Jimmy is getting mad, his dog runs away. You see, up until this time, the dog is so controlled it doesn't dare step out of line. And things have changed, and the dog says, I'm going to make a break for it. You see, even Jimmy's dog doesn't love. So this is what we find out is... Jimmy leaves his perfect world, he's still very angry, and now he's not only angry at the baseball, but he's angry that his dog has run away. And so he leaves and goes on a search to find his dog. And the question we all have is, is Jimmy going to start growing character, or is he going to remain bitter and angry? Character. Okay, character. All right, we're going to have to come back next week, okay, to see if he starts getting character. All right, thank you, boys and girls. You can go back to your seat. Well, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to James chapter 2. Um, we're going to continue there. Tape and put uh, just took a piece of tape and put 
a single piece of tape on the back of his jersey. So he was number one. Well, he's out there, and he's ready there for the face-off, and the ref kind of escapes up behind him, and it's like, all right, Stevens, I'm watching your every move. I'm going to call you on everything tonight. And this guy's trying to, you know, you have a helmet on, so you can't really see that well. And, um, and he's trying to say, well, I'm not Stevens. And um, this poor guy ended up in the penalty box so often for not doing anything that night. The ref was prejudiced against him. He thought it was me. And he was ready to just put me in the box as often as he could. And, you know, good hockey players, to avoid being in the penalty box, you have to be um, careful when you do misdemeanors or things like that so you don't end up in there. And my friend who was wearing the number one was not so careful, and so he spent lots of time in the penalty box. Anyway, he was pretty upset um, and let me know, you know, how upset he was that he was so, um, anytime there was a questionable call, the ref just called it against him. And it wasn't until the end of the game that the ref realized that it wasn't me. And it was this other guy who never goes to tell me this. But anyway, my point is, is he was discriminated against. Unjustly. He was about the same height as me, looked kind of like me, I guess. And the ref just saw number one and was used to just putting number one in the penalty. And um, it's just a, kind of a funny story of, of discrimination. And in this passage today, and what's going on in our nation, um, God kind of lined this all up together. And um, I just want to kind of go through this and, and ask the question, in light of what's going on um, in, with the, the murder of Floyd, George, and... Uh, the rioting, and then um, the number of police men and women who've been executed in all of this. Um, and then the, there are stories, I know of a, a woman um, in L.A. who, who um, things are so bad, uh, she's white, um, that she's lived there for a long time, the first time she's ever been so concerned for her safety, and she had to leave and came up here to, to, to Idaho and Washington. Um, because things are so bad, she never fell in sleep. And so um, we have all this going on, and, and so where where should the church be in all of this? And I think God's word is going to speak to us about that. Um, what we're going to see this morning is that James is going to tell us that if we ever act prejudicial to another person, it's because we have a corrupted value system as a person. Corrupted value systems are what drive discriminating against other people based on race, what they look like, whether they're poor, whether they're rich, um, whatever it is. If we are judging somebody based on appearances or culture or language, or where they're from, or if it's high school, what school they go to, or whatever it is. James is going to tell us it's because we have a corrupted value system. Now, last week we had seen, James says, pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their misfortune and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Now, what we have to recognize is we all have this propensity to be stained by the world's value system. And orphans and widows in this time period, they were the destitute people. They were the people that needed mercy. They were the people that, that couldn't do anything for you. Um, you know, if you have a, a neighbor, let's say, who is, you know, a doctor or a lawyer or um, writes for the newspaper, you know, all of us are going to want to kind of cozy up to that kind of neighbor. Because, hey, if we get into trouble, maybe he can help us, right? Um, that is the 
the idea behind the world system. The world system says, life is going to get difficult, so cozy up and be nice to people who can help you. And people who can't help you, who can't do anything for you, you can just kind of neglect them. You see, you see um, as we go into chapter 2 this morning, James says in verse 1, My brethren, talking to Christians, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. See, there was a problem in the, new, the, the church there in Jerusalem that people had favorites. They treated people differently based on exterior things. And James tells us, For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring, now, at this time period, gold rings were um, an evidence of wealth. Uh, what we find is um, Hannibal, after the Battle of Cannae, sent as a great trophy to Carthage three bushels of gold rings from the fingers of Roman knights slain in battle. Uh, so gold rings, as a man, the more rings you had on your fingers, um, the more wealthy you were. And, and James literally says a gold-fingered, uh, a gold-ringed finger uh, is kind of how the Greek renders this. So he says, if a man comes into your church service, with a bunch of gold rings and dressed in really nice clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who's wearing the fine clothes and say, hey, Mr. Wealthy Doctor, lawyer who could help me out somehow or scratch my back, you sit here in a, in a position of honor. But you say to the poor man, Hey, you know what? You stand over there and sit down and literally the Greek is sit beneath my footstool. This is what's happening in the church in, 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 in Jerusalem. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Is what he says. Um, James is saying here, in the church, we have a problem. In James's church, people would discriminate and be prejudiced against poor people, but give special treatment to those with money. And James says, when you are judging a person based on their money or any other area, you have become a judge with an evil motive. Now, that's pretty strong language that James uses the word evil. Um, you are setting yourself up as a judge and saying, this wealthy person deserves special treatment. This poor person, oh, we can just neglect him. We can totally mistreat him. And James says, hey, that's evil. Now, James goes on, and he's going to say, um, why is this evil? Listen, my beloved brethren, talk to Christians. Did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? He says, listen. God has chosen the poor people of this world to be rich in faith. Remember, it's easier for a, a rich man to pass the eye of a needle than to enter heaven. See, when you have money, and the people in the New Jerusalem church, when they had all kinds of money and fine clothes, um, whatever problem they had in life, they just threw money at it. And it, it would kind of go away. Poor people don't have that luxury. Poor people, who do they have to turn to? All they have is God. And so every day they have to trust God. Help me through today. God, I just need money to, to have some food to feed my kids today. You know, you look at the prayer life between a, a rich person 
and a poor person, and, and it's often, most of the time, going to be dramatically different. Now, he also mentions what's interesting is heirs of the kingdom. Now, this word heirs of the kingdom, what that means is these people, to be an heir of the kingdom, means to rule with Christ in the future millennial kingdom. It's a position reserved for people who have faithfully used what God has entrusted to them. And what James is saying is, in God's eyes, more often than not, poor people are spiritual millionaires and wealthy people are spiritual paupers. But you've been corrupted by the world's value system that you honor people that have so little faith in God. And the person that has unbelievable faith in God, you mistreat. And you don't love. And you neglect. And you discriminate against. And he's saying, listen, you have the wrong value system. When you have a poor person who is praying and trusting God for their, their food or for their transportation or whatever, and, and their prayer life is, is, is they, they rely on God for everything, the church needs to honor that person. He says, but you have dishonored, and here's the point, the poor man. Discrimination takes honor, the dignity and honor that every single person has been created with because they're made in the image of God, and it robs them. It takes honor that God has bestowed on everyone and takes it from them. Then James goes on, he says, is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you've been called? What James is saying is, in the, in the church in Jerusalem, they had a problem that the rich people and the powerful people were persecuting the Christians. Paul, uh, Saul of Tarsus is one of those people out persecuting them, dragging them into court. And so you see a little bit more of the background. So what what the church is doing is a rich person comes in to their congregation and they give them all kinds of honor because, hey, they don't, they want this person to see them as a nice person. And, and, and they, they roll out the red carpet for them in hopes that this rich person will do something good for them or not drag them into court. Or somehow they benefit. And what James is trying to say is true, genuine Christianity without hypocrisy is about loving and helping and giving mercy to people who can't give you anything in return. Jesus says, hey, it's great that you, you love your family and it's great that you love people that are nice to you. But real love is you love people who don't give you anything. And so James is, is really taking them to task on the fact that God honors the poor and they have lost God's value system. See, God's value system in verse 8 says this, If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You're doing well. But, if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. So what he's saying is, now he opens it up wider, he's not just talking about rich and poor. He says, if we show partiality to anyone based on exterior things, race, Money. What they look like, where they grew up, their culture, their nationality, whatever it is, we're committing sin 
and are convicted by the law as transgressors. What James says here is God's value system is equal treatment to everyone. The royal law, what is the royal law? Okay, love your neighbor as yourself. See, what is the cure for our country right now? Love your neighbor as yourself. Let's pause for a little bit here. One of the things that love does is love covers a multitude of sins. Um, love mourns with those who mourn, weeps with those who weep. And, and I just want to—I just want to say this: um, in America today, our black brothers and sisters are hurting. And I, I can't claim to understand. But as Christians, we have to stop and listen. And whether, you know, we, we can argue on statistics and, and we can argue about, um, you know, are, are, are there more black people killed by police than white people? And we can go back and forth. But we've got to be merciful and realize that for, for all of us, appearance is reality. And that's the way we live. And um, the reality is they feel discriminated against. Now, now, one of the things we have to understand is when this country was founded, black people had three-fifths the voting ability as a white person. It wasn't until the civil rights movement in the late 60s where black people could ride on a bus with white people where black people in some parts of the country could go to the same school as white people where they could use the same bathrooms and drink out of the same water fountain like we've got to realize that now my ancestors are from Canada and Australia um, my ancestors weren't here it, it doesn't do me any good to say well hey it's not me no, what does compassion say? It says, you know, this country, we have an Achilles heel of slavery, of owning other people based on their color. We've got to realize that. Um, to go even further, which is even more appalling today, is our Native Americans. Uh, where I lived in Wyoming. It was right close to the Wind River Reservation. And it is um, the worst of all reservations. It is, it, it's, it's the saddest state of affairs. And did you know that Native American women were the only people group in the United States that they did not keep track of missing persons? It wasn't just recently until President Trump all of a sudden says, no, we've got to count when a, when a Native American woman goes missing. We've got, to, we've got to document that. And just up until recently, if you were a Native American woman and you went missing, a lot of people didn't even care. And we got to understand that. Um, in Lander, outside, not far from where we live, uh, people remember um, 100 years ago uh, the Native Americans there, um, I think at least 200 of them starved to death. Because it was against the law to feed them, and I don't know what all, what, what all happened, and I don't know the ins and outs, but all I know is people made in God's image were starved to death. God says, do unto others as you have been doing to you. Love your neighbor as yourself. I, I don't know all the answers here, but what I'm saying is, we've got to understand these things. And we are our brother's keeper. 
And, and if our brothers and sisters that are maybe Native American or black or from, from Hispanic or from different cultures, and they're hurting, we've got to, we've got to, we've got to stop and see something. I don't know if you know that, that a black woman in America today is five times more likely to die in childbirth than a white woman. I don't know why that is. But that's, that's the statistics right there. Um, you know, we can, we can point the finger and blame and do all this kind of thing, but the church... We, we've got to somehow be the solution to what's going on in the world right now. And we've got to see people are hurting. And we can't deny that they're hurting. We've got to realize the background. Just like any of you. Let's say you come into our church. And let's say you screwed your life up. And how do you want us to view you? You want us to say, hey, this is, a, this is the spiritual trauma center of the community. If you're hurting, if you shot yourself in the foot, if you screwed up, Jesus still has a hope for you. And with Him, there's mercy, there's compassion. You know, we, we, we do create so many of our own problems. But that doesn't give us the right to withhold compassion. See, God's royal law says, love your neighbor as yourself. And what this means is, we got to put ourselves in other people's shoes. You know, if, if your um, ancestors um, you know, were treated where people put smallpox on blankets and handed them out to women and children. Um, and I'm not saying there weren't atrocities going back and forth. But Christians are called to a higher level. We've got to understand that. We've got to think through that. We've got to understand where they're coming from. That's just loving your neighbor as yourself. And like this, this poor old world, folks, it needs Jesus. And I don't have I don't have the answers. But I know that God is asking the church today to carry out his value system. And his value system says if you're white or black or native or whatever it is, you're made in his image. And because you're made in his image, you have value. So we've got to figure out how to do that. Every single person has value to God. And our, what James is telling us, if we judge somebody, you know, if we look at a poor person and we say, well, you know what? You're poor because you're, you're bad with money. You're poor because you can't go to a Larry Burkett whatever, or Dave Ramsey and get your financial life together. Um, if we look at anybody and say, well, you know, you should be doing better than you are, or you made these mistakes, therefore, you made your bed, you sleep in it. We've lost the gospel. You know, it, it, it goes deeper. Um, I remember reading a report about 
prostitutes in America, and most prostitutes in America would get out of it if they could. And I think it was Tony Campolo said, hey, if, if you needed help, where would you turn? They said, well, we don't really know. They said, well, would you turn to the church? And they all, across the board, unequivocally said, absolutely not. If we go to the church, we would be so judged. But folks, prostitutes love Jesus. They were drawn to him. They flocked after him. Something's wrong. If we're doing church different than Jesus would have done. And we've got to look at that. The royal law. It's a royal law because it's the king. King Jesus is the one who gives it. And King Jesus says, listen. How do you navigate this world? Pretty easy. Love your neighbor. As you love yourself. We've got to ask questions. Like. I know we don't have a large population of, of African American people here, but we have a, a large population of Native Americans here. Um, we've got to say to ourselves, if I was Native, and if I went through what they did and had their background, how do I, how would I need to be loved? You know, why is it we don't have more Native Americans in our church? Is it God's will that, that every Native American family in our, in our valley here go to a Bible teaching church? Absolutely. So we've got to say, what, what, what do we need to do? You know, one of the wonderful things about heaven is the Bible says that people from every tribe, tongue, and language are going to be there, and there's unity there. So the church needs to start doing that now. And we need to figure, hey, what do we need to do? And then James goes a little further here, and he's kind of taking these people to task. He says, for whoever keeps the whole law, yet stumbles in one point has become guilty of one. So he says, you know what, Christians? You could, you could say, well, listen, I tithe, and I've been baptized, and I do this, and I do that. But you know, yeah, I, I, I am prejudiced, but it's not a big deal. He says, look, if you stumble at one point, you're guilty of breaking all of God's law. For he who said, do not commit a murder, murder also said, do not commit I'm sorry. Do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you become a transgressor of the law. Now what James is kind of getting at is in, in Proverbs, the Bible tells us there are six things that the Lord hates. And the top of the list is haughty eyes. In other words, eyes that look down on somebody else. And then James continues, he says, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of the for judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Now what is he talking about here? What he's saying is this. is for the Christian, every Christian is going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We aren't judged. If you believe in Jesus for eternal life, you're going to heaven and there's no way you can ever lose your salvation. But at the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema, every one of us, our works, what we've done, are, is going to be judged. The Bible tells us, 1 Corinthians 3, that everything we've done is put into the furnace. And what we've done with right motives for Jesus passes through the furnace. But the wood, hay, and stubble burn up. And so everything I've done with my time, my talents, my treasure, God is going to evaluate. And God's going to say, okay, Jeff, now, as I evaluate you, I am first going to evaluate you based on how judgmental you 
were toward other people. So Jeff, if you were really judgmental on other people, and you were exacting with other people, that's how I am going to render my judgment on you. I'm going to be exact. And I'm going to have the same attitude you display to other people. Now, I don't know about you, but at the judgment seat of Christ, I don't want Jesus to be exact. I need a lot of, like, okay, give him the benefit of the doubt. I need a lot of, you know what, he was confused. You know what? He wasn't that smart. You know what? He had a lot of stuff acting on. You know what? I know that those sins he's committed 1,325,000,000 times, but look at the family he grew up in. See, what is mercy? Mercy is not giving someone what they deserve. And as Christians, if we make a habit of being merciful in our view of other people, guess what? God's going to say, well, you know what, Jeff? You were so you were, you were merciful to other people when they hurt you, and, and you gave them a way out, and, and you weren't exacting it, and you didn't evaluate them and size them up and then critique them. So you know what, Jeff? I'm going to be really lean in how I look at you. It's kind of like God putting together a high, highlight reel of our life. You know, if you're if you're a high school football player, um, you send your highlight reel to college coaches. Okay? And, and the question is, what's in the highlight reel? Well, if you're a running back, you don't want your highlight reel filled with all your fumbles. You want it filled with touchdowns and, and tackles and all these wonderful things that you've done. And, and it's as if God's putting together the highlight reel of our life at the judgment seat of Christ. And he's going to ask, okay, how did you evaluate other people? How did you judge them? What do you want included in your highlight? And I think what this applies to is, is when we see people looting and, and rioting, obviously we don't in any way say that that's okay. Obviously it's not right. Um, obviously murdering policemen is not right. None of that is okay with God. But we do need to stop and say, okay, what, what is going on? In the psyche of, of, of these, our brothers and sisters that are turning to these things. Let's try to understand what's happening. You know, another, another area is so many times in the church we expect unbelievers to live like Christians. We, we expect non-Christians to live like Christians. And when they go, we judge them. See, God is saying, hey, how you view other people is so, so important. God is going to be merciless to the one who's gone through their life and being exacting and judgmental to other people. See, the world system says, favor those who can help you. Favor those who make your life easier. In the church, favor the people that are highly functional. Favor the people that don't cause any problems in church. Favor the people that can put money in the offering. Favor the people that can mow the grass and, and do nice things. Because the flesh is saying, look out for number one. The devil is saying, God is holding something from you, so you better use the world system or you're not going to get where you need to go. And when we rationalize,
things here. Uh, if this was supposed to come out in a really wonderful shock and awe kind of way um, <laughs> to impress you. What James is saying is when we rationalize our behavior, in other words, we say, well, I'm a pretty good person. We judge other people. We don't show mercy. It's the evidence that our value system has become corrupted and now we prejudge other people. And he's saying, this is why the church has the label of being hypocrites. This is why we have so much hypocrisy in the world. See, prejudice is an evidence of the world's value system. We set ourselves up as a judge. God's value system honors the poor. The world's value system honors those who hate God. God's value system is equal love to everybody. And with James and God, prejudice is no small matter. Prejudice is the evidence of an identity crisis. It's the evidence of someone who says, you know what? I'm not God's child. God's not going to take care of me. So I need to be nice to people who can be nice to me, and I judge those people who I think are inferior. And we, as a, as a church family, we need to think about our role in this. We need to think, how can we be part of the solution right now? And, and folks, I don't have, I don't have the answers. But I just think we need to listen. We need to listen and say, okay, if our, if our brothers and sisters are hurting, we need to listen. And we shouldn't devalue them. What they're saying. Howard Hendricks wrote this. I had an experience from which I will not soon recover. As many of you know, I'm associated with the Dallas Cowboys. Howard Hendricks, he was one of my professors at seminary, he was a chaplain. They graciously invited my wife and me to come to Miami for the Super Bowl. Now you remember Cowboys, that's God's favorite team. It kind of a favorite team would be the Cowboys. Um, <laughs> We arrived on Friday and the guy said, Hey Doc, come out to the field with us and watch our practice. I always enjoyed it. So I went out to the field and I saw an older man on the side. And I said, That looks like Woody Hayes. Any of you remember Woody Hayes? What happened? I really mistreated the player. I thought, What in the world is he doing here? I better watch out. I found out it was Woody Hayes. On Sunday morning, I ministered the Word of God to them. After their chapel, they have a king meal. I usually spend that time eating with them. This time I happened to be sitting next to Coach Lamb. At the next table was Woody Hayes. I said, Coach, what's Woody doing here? He said, Howie, he's hurting. He needs help. I invited him to come down as my guest. Maybe the Lord will give me an opportunity to minister to him. I went through the floor. You see, when everybody in America was on this man's case, how many individuals, including born-again believers, were reaching out? We don't reach out. We prefer that individuals like this got their comeuppance. In terms of what James is talking about, discrimination. You know what we need in the body of Christ right now? He says, a larger core of non-discriminating people like that man, a tall man. As he said to me later, Howie, he's in football. And that's my responsibility. You would probably never, ever reach what he is. You might not reach a lot of people in other areas. The question is, are you sensitive about the people that God brings into your sphere of influence in which he wants the word of God to go to work, to deliver you so think about that. In your sphere of influence, people you rub shoulders. How can God use you? 
to be an agent of mercy. To be a person who shows the love of Jesus. Who doesn't in any way prejudge or discriminate. But let's fill this church with people who are just filled with mercy. Right? Because we're all going to need mercy. And we will all give an account to Jesus. Let's pray.